the letters of Paul to uh, Romans. And I have uh, printed out here some information sheets. So um, the thoughts that I have in mind, I just jotted on a piece of paper. So it's gonna be like handy uh, for you to follow. And uh, I'm gonna just uh, uh, display it. And I leave the rest with Mr. Pokhtor. All right, so as I mentioned, we resume. I'm, I'll try to be fast and quick and just to the point, no preaching, just to get, you know, ideas and, and thoughts and just shed lights on some of the what, yeah, sorry, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, thank you. All right, thanks. Thank you, Abuna, bless you, thanks. So there is um, a common, idea of conflict between uh, the letter of James and the theology of St. Paul in these um, letters to Romans. It seems conflict, but if you understand from where each, each one coming from, it will be easy. So is there, there is, the first question, is there any conflict between Paul's gospel of grace in Romans and James' letter in regard of salvation. Um, if you go, there, there's some, some guy named John Buckley's. He has a book. Um, I'll give you the name of that book. Uh, Perspective Old and New on Paul by John uh, Barclay. There is page, in, in page 58 and also page 56, uh, he, did, he said that. Forgiveness of sins and acceptance with God are only the beginning of life in which the character of the sinner is being increasingly transformed and God-pleasing works are produced in a redeemed person where justification makes sinner gain favor with God and sanctification by which sinner is progressively remade into God's image. So the idea is Paul was zooming in the way he approached the Romans. He was zooming in from the angle of brings that brings a sinner to the point of salvation. Salvation by grace through faith. By grace through faith. Um, while James, James in the other hand, he was focusing on the behavior of the sinners after being saved. So they are not, actually they are complementary to each other. So in, in the, the, another question, is there a difference between Adam's nature before the fall and after? Looks like a dummy question. Of course there is. But has Adam been created with ability to live forever? Or he has been created in a state of being that could be mortal and could be live forever depends on choice made. That's something to think about. The key verses in Romans 6, I chose verse 10 and verse 23. Verse 10 mentioned for the death that he died, he's speaking about Jesus. 
for the death that he died. He died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The second verse is verse number 23. And it says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus our Lord. So there is a key word in the verse number 10. Two key words, actually. Likewise and reckon. Reckon means consider yourself. Consider yourself that. Some, somebody, I, I feel like I have to get like like plazed or, or um, congratulated to be dead. Sometimes I, I, I'm at the, the mirror and see, George, you are dead. <laughs> Praise God, George, you are dead. Yeah, I am dead. But the life of Christ is in me. That's a thing that we, we really, we celebrate our death in Christ. That's why St. Paul in other area, he said, we are not dead, but we asleep. We asleep. When we change our, when God, you know, uh, call our souls and our spirit, we are not really dead because the death from God's perspective, it's going right to hell. It's a spiritual death. But the death that we sometimes celebrate, I admire people when they celebrate the, the, the life of somebody at the moment of death. So it's, it's not mourning on the death moment, but getting the positive picture about this soul and spirit now got liberated. You know, one person, I think in one of the movies, um, something, Clark Douglas or something like that in one of his movies uh, said, the person is free when he's dead. The person is free when he is dead. So, the key words I want to us to think about it uh, in um, Romans 6 is uh, baptism. And I mentioned before, likewise, reckon, consider yourself. And likewise, I, I really, I put line underneath likewise, because he is comparing what Jesus, the perception of Jesus in his death and resurrection with our perception in the new life. When we, we, we became dead, to sin, we became dead to the world, but life for God's pleasure. So this comparison is invitation for us not to live like a weak life or, or a washy-washy life or, or unvictorious life. No, it's invitation to live victorious like Jesus. He did overcome the death once and for good. The other word is baptism and newness of life, co-united the likeness of his, the body of sin, old, the old man, slaves, mortal body, and grace. And the word grace is, we touch on the word grace before in, in a session before, but I did reward that, and I mentioned in, the, in I think, um, Romans 2, I said it's very hard to put a definition to grace, especially if we are talking about the grace of God, because it's limitless, gracious grace that you cannot really put a certain definition, but at least to make the idea close to our mind, uh, grace is receiving or it's a receiving of undeserved, gener generous, gracious gift that 
reflects the very virtue of gracious giver granted to the most undeserved sinner like me, who receives it by gratitude and thanksgiving. God's grace is priceless. It is God's richness in the expense of Christ Jesus when he gave his body as an ultimate sin offering to wipe out our sins, nature, and deeds of whoever receives. Thus, it takes two to have God's grace be activated in my life. Though God's grace is limitless, but it needs me, it needs my response to activate God's grace. I was listening to one of the person that I really admire, uh, Jen Peterson. He's, he's a top psychologist in Canada. Um, uh, Jordan, Jordan Peterson, right? If I'm not mistaken, the name. And he has a panel discussion about Exodus. And in that panel discussion, he brought scholars from everywhere and he incorporated a Jewish scholar. Like, that's his, that his religion is Jewish. And his uh, specialty in the Torah. And Dennis, his name, the Jewish guy, he said, I cannot buy unconditional love. I cannot, I cannot buy it. Because in the Old Testament, God in his laws is saying, if you did that, you became that, your attitude would be like that, I would bless you. So the blessings God in the Old Testament is conditioned by if I did that. But the way I look at it is really the love of God is unconditional because unconditional, it attributes to the initiatives that God initiates the love without it being me worthy of it. So it is in the original motivation of God, it's unconditional. But any love needs the response of the receiver. So if here in the Old Testament, it's not a condition, it is a facilitation. If you would like to facilitate my unconditional love, please do this. Be that. Think different. Have a different mindset. Change your heart. Turn around. Come back to me. Keep me in the picture. Fear me. It's not a condition. It's the way it is. It is the pathway of the grace. But still, God's love is 100% unconditional. Because nobody forced God to die for me. We didn't do anything that, you know, encouraged God to come and get incarnated for, because I did something good that deserve his incarnation. So God, God's love is unconditional. Because God's love reflects the very virtue of God. God is love. He can't, he can't help it. He can't help it but love. But bestow blessings. But the, the receiver has responsibility toward the giver to enjoy what the giver is willing to bestow on us. So, there's some facts and decrees. And really, after I read it, I would like all of us to, to say it loud. So, facts and decrees. Look at the paper, because you're going to read So let's say, the wage of sin is death. Let's say it again. The wages of sin is death. No, I didn't hear anything. The, yeah, is death. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I am 
free from sin. Let's do it together. I am. I am free from sin, slave of God. Yeah, I am slave of God. Free of sin, I am slave of God. This is all in, uh, in Romans 6, by the way. Slave of righteousness. Sin has no dominion over me. Sin has no dominion over me. I am not under the law. I am under God's grace. Old man was crucified. I present myself. I obeyed from the heart. I have been set free of to become slave to. Here you go. So, if God has set us free, is to be slave to something else, to somebody else. As Clark Douglas said, person is free when he's dead. And I think that's St. Paul in chapter 6 is emphasizing that, especially when we speak about baptism. So we are free from sin, from the old attachment to the world, to be slave to a good master, a master that enriches me, a master that enlarges me, a master that blesses me to the righteousness. And, and that's, people think that freedom is, well, I'm flying there, freedom. That no obligation, no guidelines, no, no feedback, like no commitment. I'm free. That's not a freedom. That's illusion. But freedom is to be freed from things that can lead you to death. But in order to continue in the life path, you need to be slave to the righteousness. And this slavery is a beautiful slavery. It's a slavery can give you the full potential of your life. The full potential of your life is as if you are incubated in the grace. So, how beautiful if we are slave to the grace. That means you are always at the receiving end. Always you receive the love. Always you receive the blessings. Always you receive the walk of life in you, through you. So, I'll touch bases on, on the baptism because, um, okay. Yes. Sure, yeah. You, you can ask and the Buddha here. <laughs> no, I just, uh, I want to mind my thing about sleep. Yes. Uh, there's no any other word? Actually, St. Paul has, you know, troubled with that term. And in, in, in the same chapter 6, he said, I am using the term slaves because of the weakness of, of your life, like for, for the lack of better word, put it this way, for the lack of better, of better word. But slavery is not with the negative um, impression about it, or meaning of it, it's slavery with the positive meaning of it, that you are a slave to a good master. So if you are a slave to a good master, he's gonna lift you up. It's not the opposite way. But, St. Paul struggled with, with, with the terminology, if, if you read chapter 6. Yeah, he did struggle with the same thing. Right, Abuna? Maybe, yeah, maybe, uh... Sometimes in the uh, Greek language, which is the original language of the New Testament, but also in the Hebrew, which is the original language of the Old Testament, um, poetry is written in parallels. So you make 
the perils of two of two things, but you give the two extremes. So that's a type of, of a poetic uh, writing. So as you will see on the screen, it says, you're going from one extreme of being a slave of sin to becoming a slave of God. Now, slavery in our mind is usually connected with a negative connotation, meaning abuse and torture. Uh, but actually, slavery was um, somewhat familiar to a first century audience, whereas you had good and kind masters and then very abusive masters. So St. Paul was speaking about being owned or completely owned or belonging to a really good master. But maybe in today's context, of course, that word slave is, um, has very negative connotations in, in our mind because all the slaves have been set free, etc. And, and all the abuse that happened, of course, uh, to many communities around the world. So in our context, we can um, replace that word slave with the word servant, or someone who is willingly giving themselves to serve a good master. Meaning that God, if we look at him, not only as, as a master, but he said, I will no longer call you servants or slaves, but I will call you friends. So God has upgraded his children who are redeemed by his grace to not looking at us as slaves any longer, but He's looking at us as children and as beloved and as redeemed. And again, the key words here, as George is saying, refer back to these words, grace and mercy and love and forgiveness. All of these qualities do not belong to a mean slave master, someone who wants to take advantage. But in that context, it refers to being, being safe with someone who can take care, good care of you like a parent, or like a loving parent, if we can say the analogy, or like a guardian, or someone who would keep these individuals who have been tormented by the world in a safe environment where he is giving them food and shelter and a place to belong to. So you are completely right that that word slave of God no longer carries the same meaning that it would carry to someone who lived 2,000 years ago because people felt safety in that concept of being a slave to God. But for now, we can look at it as equivalent to children, beloved, uh, and looking at God as a, as a father or, or a guardian. That, that would, was the image that St. Paul was trying to convey in, in this context. In, in that, what God, yeah, what, what St. Paul is trying to say is that, you know, he set himself free from the bondage of, of sin, because sin is like a bad master, and he willingly gave himself to serve God, to be a servant of God. So that's the meaning in that context. Thank you, Abuna. So we'll, we'll, we'll jump into baptism. Uh, baptism is a declaration of the fact that we have been co-buried with Jesus as going into the Hades so that no further punishment would be on us. And we have been co-crucified and we have been co-resurrected. So we have been with Christ in his suffering and we have been with Christ in his burial and we have been with Christ when he went to the Hades as we have been in Adam's when Adam sins because with the sin of Adam death and sin run into 
the human race. So, thus, the, with, with the grace of God, with the resurrection of Christ, life springs into us, and we became life as Jesus, as Jesus lived. So, co-resurrection with Christ as into the Father's glory so that we would be able to live for God's pleasure. You remember verse 10? If we go to verse 10, which is a key verse in here. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Unlike, and likewise, you also. So, the co-resurrected with Christ as into the Father's glory so that we would be able to live for God's pleasure through seeing ourselves in Christ Jesus, who is at the right hand of the Father, granted us victorious life. It is an invitation to live the now from the future by holding on God's promises. And that's how the church been driven. The church been driven eschatologically. Like the church see the, the four beyond the scene and take grips into the promises and by which grip we live now, we live the moment. So it's amazing how God created a new concept a new mindset. You are not living the moment from your past because your past has been dealt with on the cross. I have been died with the cross, with, with Jesus on the cross. The past, the engine of sin has been dealt with. The nature of sin has been dealt with. The origin of sin has been dealt with. The sin of Adam has been dealt with on the cross. So I can live the life of Christ now. If we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Uh, Paul has many questions, uh, but I'll run it fast. Um, Paul said, when sin increased, grace increased all the more. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? It's all rational questions. But you remember the, the purpose of the letter to Romans was to um, make the Messianic Jewish and the Gentile Christian regain unity again. Be one again, because at one point you remember that uh, you know the all the Jews has been you know evacuated from Romans uh, because of political things, and and then um, the 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 church was has only um, Gentile Christians, while basically originally it was built on the Messianic uh, Jewish, which is uh, the, the Jewish people that believed in Christ while they heard Peter on Acts 2, um, and, and they just go there, and the, even, I would imagine, also from Cornelius, if you remember Cornelius, Cornelius he was a Roman a lieutenant, and he got baptized by the Holy Spirit and by water, and uh, might some of their, uh, their relatives uh, built the church there. They start the, the new faith in Romans. You know, there is lots of factors that uh, the church in Romans was originally Jewish, inclusive. But after uh, the Christianity has been uh, spread around, there was Gentile, Gentiles came to Christ and after, when persecution happened to Jewish people, the Jews left the Romans, but they returned back after, I think, five years or so, if I'm not mistaken. So, Paul was trying to tie the knots, <laughs> like they tried to get them together in one spirit and, and one goal. So, the conclusion of chapter six, I would say, 
people of Israel through Moses have received the law of the Pentecost while disciples had received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost after Jesus um, resurrection you know in the Old Testament I'm, I'm going to do some compar sweet comparison between the Old Testament and the new in this area because the Pentecost day was a, a day of celebration at the Jewish calendar right Abuna yeah um, but they were celebrating the the receiving of law the Torah uh, after Moses has spent 40 days in, in the, on the mountain, and then after 10 days, they received the laws. And you remember that the laws of Moses, it's called, it doesn't really called a law, but it's instructions and guidelines. That's the, the word, but when it trans, uh, translates to uh, Greek, so nemos, nemos means laws. But originally it's, originally, it's instructions. And it's about 613 instructions in, in the Old Testament. But the Moses, the law of Moses has been given through angels in order to guide people to the point of repentance. The point of repentance. But in the Christian Pentecost, God has sent his Holy Spirit on fiery things on the disciples in order to give them victorious life. It's not only you're bad and you need to be, you know, repented. No, you are elected and I am empowering you. I know your weaknesses. That's why I died for you. And I'll give you my power that lives in Jesus. I give you the, 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 the spirit of Christ to, be, to live in you. So you can live a victorious power. A, a victorious, powerful life. So, chapter 6 and 7, it set the stage for chapter 8. And chapter 8, somebody called it the Romans of Romans, the romance, romance of Romans, because it's beautiful. Um, I will just um, give a brief um, word about it. Uh, wh how many kinds of baptism that Christian life has? What do you think? Hmm? One baptism, all right? But the word baptism has been used nine times in the New Testament for different reasons. I know it's one baptism, but there is more than meaning for the baptism. So there is a water baptism, and there is a Holy Spirit baptism. And if you look at Acts, St. Paul got filled with the Holy Spirit and then got baptized. The, the disciples didn't need to be baptized because they were baptized before. If you go to, I think, um, there is, um, in one point or so, Jesus was baptizing as well. And, and even uh, like Pharisees, went, the Pharisee went to uh, John the Baptist and he said, this guy that you proclaim, he's the son of God. And, you know, he baptized, he and his disciples. So, the, there is a water baptism. There is a Holy Spirit, baptism with the Holy Spirit. And there is a baptism of suffering. A baptism of suffering. And uh, there is also... The baptism is suffering uh, when, when, when the two disciples, uh, John and I think his brother went to, uh, the mother of John uh, went to, his, uh, to Jesus and she said, I want my, my, child to be, my children to be one on your right hand and one on the, uh, or left hand. Uh, he, he said, if you are willing to uh, bear 
my pain and bear my 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 suffering um you're more than welcome but in, but for whoever gonna but god the father he's the only one who decides who's gonna be on my left who's gonna be my my right so there is a suffering baptism and i believe that the suffering baptism that's uh, indicated here is once you are with christ all the world should like granted would be against you the evil word will be against you and going through that the hardship the trials is a suffering with christ but with our eyes on the resurrection uh the as as i mentioned before because the the church is is catholic is catholic is i lost the word Eschatologically, 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 yeah. Driven, the the baptism of water and Holy Spirit, they came together with anointing, with anointing. And sometimes we forget the meaning of baptism because we take it as a ritual. We take it as something we have to do like circumcision, you know, I've been circumcised, you know, most of the boys are, have been circumcised, but there is a deeper meaning in baptism that we have to dig into it. We have to understand what baptism is all about. It's to have my, my kernel body, my old man be crucified on the cross completely. And what I live now is Christ in me. And that's a mindset that goes to the baptism of suffering because you are, you are living against the flow of the world by choosing God's choice and godly choices. So we need to dig deeper in the baptism. And I mentioned on, uh, like when I was uh, dealing with uh, chapter two, I was like asking the church to do classes for parents who is expecting child and 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 make like study to the baptism uh, for eight weeks or so to to understand the depth of the baptism baptism is not only that i am dead but also it's i am buried and also i am resurrected and our church is focused on the resurrection, on the expense of the cross. But sometimes we dwell in, 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 in the bury thing, in the tomb thing, more than, you know, thinking about the life in Christ is resurrected. I think by this, I would conclude my notes here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abuna, for giving me that opportunity. I think it's uh, prudent to uh, to read this beautiful chapter uh, together. Okay, how about if we uh, just stand together and we can read it all together so we can now put all the meditations and explanations into context. Uh, we can read it from the screen together. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that the grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who die to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, 
we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ our Lord. Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. And do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What then shall we sin? What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart, that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanliness and of lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For you, when you are slaves of sin, you are free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Heavenly Father, we praise you, Lord. We honor you. We give you glory to your holy name because you are a gracious and a loving God. And you did not abandon us, Lord, when we had fallen into sin. But you came to us and renewed our nature, giving us another chance and another opportunity, Lord, to make things better. We thank you, Lord, because you gave us an option to renew our lives and to live with you eternally. For the wages of sin indeed, Lord, is death. But the gift that you have given us is eternal life. That eternal life is in your Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ. We praise you, Lord, and we honor you. And we thank you, for you have set us free, Lord. How beautiful it is to live in freedom, no longer bound under the wages of sin, but free, Lord, to live eternally with you and to receive your gift of grace and of salvation. We thank you, Lord, for giving us these reminders and opportunities to always uh, renew our mind, Lord, and for giving us this renewal in the holy baptism, whereas we put off the old person and put on a new and renewed uh, person that is able to inherit eternal life in your, the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for your word that guides and lights our hearts, our lives, and every decision that we make. Lord Jesus, may we leave this uh, holy place, not the same manner that we entered into it, but having completely put on the whole armor of God and a new robe, Lord, that is um, free from all the blemishes of sin, but one that is able to live with a lifted uh, head, lifted up high, Lord, knowing that we are children of the true God. I ask you, Lord, to extend your blessing to each and every one of my sisters and brothers and, and our fathers and mothers who are present here tonight, Lord, that we would walk away, Lord, having been filled with your love, with your grace, and with your forgiveness. This we pray in your holy name, intercession of St. Mary, the prayers of all the choir of the saints who pleased you since the beginning. Hear us, dear Lord, as we pray with all thanksgiving, our Father who art in heavens. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
and lead us not in temptations, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The love of God the Father, grace is only begotten Son, our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, communion, gift of the Holy Spirit be with you. Go in peace. May the peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen.